Are we waiting, Jen, for anyone else? Any other? Okay. Okay, but the press were, were good. Okay. 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 Great. Okay, we're going to start. Um, as members come in, we moved it up a few minutes so uh, they can speak when they come in. Good afternoon. Uh, the council is going to vote on the following finance items today. A pre-considered resolution which I've sponsored that would ratify my authorization to bring a legal action on behalf of the council in the matter of the council versus the Department of City Planning. Uh, this uh, proceeding concerns the council's challenge to the City Planning Commission's approval of an alleged minor modification to the two bridges development in Councilmember Margaret Chin's uh, district. We filed a lawsuit last week, and I'm pleased to report our efforts in court were successful in ensuring development will not proceed until the court has an opportunity to hear our case on the merits. Uh, the Department of City Planning agreed not to issue approval letters to the Department of Buildings for the applications uh, that went through the land use process, pausing the process until we return to court, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, the council will vote on the following property tax exemptions at the following locations. West Farms in Councilmember Salamanca's district, uh, 388 Richmond Terrace in Councilmember Rose's district, the Turin House, in Councilmember Helen Rosenthal's district, Lang Sam 15 in Councilmember Torres's district, and exemptions for six properties in Manhattan that are being transferred through round 10 of the third party transfer program. The council will vote on the following land use items today. We'll be voting on several uh, landmark, um, uh, landmark uh, designations in Councilmember Brad Landers' district, 238 President uh, Street House, it's a designation of one of, Car one of Carroll Garden's largest and most luxurious 19th century houses. Hans S. Christian Memorial Kindergarten. It's a landmark designation of uh, the first purpose-built free kindergarten in Brooklyn, and it was commissioned by Elmira E. Christian. And then there is a DOT Brooklyn Fleet Services site selection in Gowanus, also in Councilmember Landers District. We're gonna vote uh, on an amendment to the Urban Development Action Area Project, a UDAP, to facilitate the development of a new residential bu uh, building with 135 units for low-income seniors at Victory Plaza in Councilmember Perkins' district. And the council will vote on four tax exemptions, Clinton Urban Renewal Area in Site 7, uh, that is in my district, uh, 464 and 468 West 51st Street, also in my district, Joe Central Brooklyn in Council Member uh, Levin, Cumbo, Cornegie, Amprey Samuel, and uh, Barron's districts, 79 uh, different buildings, and 590 Southern Boulevard in Council Member Ayala's district. Uh, the council is also gonna vote on a new District 75 uh, Intermediate High School in Minority Leader Matteo's district with a capacity of 456 seats for uh, D75 students across the entire borough of Staten Island. And then we're gonna vote on the following piece of legislation. Resolution 470, which I sponsored, calls on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign Assembly Bill 4738 and Senate Bill 4840A, legislation that would establish the New York uh, Health Act, a universal single payer health plan for all New York residents. As I've spoken about before, I am HIV positive, and so this legislation, which would help so many people with chronic conditions, is extremely important to me. Very excited it passed the health committee yesterday with a unanimous vote. The council will vote on resolution 620, sponsored by council member Francisco Moya, which would call on the Federal Communications Commission to reject the proposed rules that would jeopardize the public, educational and governmental access television across, uh, included in the city's cable franchises. Uh, next, the council is gonna vote on proposed uh, introduction uh, 986A, sponsored by Councilmember Peter Ku, which would require that data contained within required reports and studies be transmitted in a format that makes such data machine readable and easily accessible. The council will also vote on two bills and a resolution sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger that would bring oversight to city school budgets and the Department of Education's fair student formula funding. 
uh, introduction 1014 would require the Department of Education to annually submit and post a report on spending allocations, including fair student funding for all schools citywide. Introduction 1174 would create a fair student funding task force to review and make recommendations relating to the exact formula used by the Department of Education to determine school funding. And resolution 569 would call on the Department of Education to factor in poverty as a weight and fair student formula funding for schools beginning at fourth grade or later. Finally, the council will vote on a package of legislation that will improve the city's tracking of diversity and employment. Introduction 752, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, would create an Office of Diversity and Inclusion within the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. It would be tasked with developing recruitment, hiring, and career advancement procedures to achieve greater diversity in the city's workforce. And I want to invite the Majority Leader to speak on her bill. Thank you so much, Speaker Corey Johnson, and thank you so much for your leadership on this particular piece of legislation. As one of the most diverse cities in the country and as a city that employs over 383,000 people in public agencies, New York City must be a leader and a model for equitable workplaces. Our workforce must reflect our diversity and dynamic communities that we represent. I am thrilled along with Speaker Corey Johnson to put forth a bill that expands critical aspects of equity in the workplace and promotes economic well-being for our city's workers. Intro number 752A creates an Office of Diversity and Inclusion within DCAS, which will ensure that New York City is a leader in anti-discrimination and equality in the workplace. DCAS is mandated to report annual data on the makeup of its governmental workforce and provide assistance to minority group members and women employed by or interested in being employed by city agencies. This bill would adequately task the office with four different components, compiling and releasing employment statistics, two, ensuring accountability by evaluating each city agency, Three, developing policies and best practices to ensure that adequate support, training, and mentorship is made available to underrepresented city employees. And four, developing recruitment, hiring, and career advancement procedures that address systematic barriers to achieve greater diversity in the recruitment process. I want to thank everyone that worked on making this landmark and historical, or as I should say, historical legislation possible. I want to thank my staff, Monica Aben, and my co-sponsors, Justin Brennan, Ben Kalos, Helen Rosenthal, and of course I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson, uh, Monica Aben, and Gail Black on my staff for working with me to make this happen. This is certainly going to change the dynamics of city agencies moving forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. Uh, next, uh, we are going to have two bills sponsored by Councilmember Matthew Eugene. Introduction 755 would require the Equal Employment Practices Commission, the EEPC, to analyze and report annually on whether agencies are meeting their racial and ethnic affirmative employment service objectives, and when not, identify the underutilized groups and provide recommendations on corrective action. And introduction 756 would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to include in its annual report an analysis of employee response rates to the city's efforts to collect racial demographic information of city employees and whether changes in the racial and ethnic classification categories have an impact on employee response rates. And I want to introduce Councilmember Eugene to come up and speak on these bills. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you so very much. Uh, Andrew 755A and Andrew 756A are two bills that I'm uh, very proud to have introduced. Andrew 755A requiring the Equal Employment Practice Commission to analyze and report annually on city racial and ethnic classification on their utilization. And to go 756A will require the Department of Citywide Administration Service to review and report annually on the city's effort to collect racial and ethnic demographic information, including a review of racial classification categories and employee response rates. As one of the most diverse cities in the country, and as one of the New York City's biggest employers, it is vital that the city's civil service reflect the people that it serves. This is uh, especially important because according to the 
U.S. Census Bureau, historically, one route to upward social mobility has been employment and local government. As the most recent data available make clear, currently there are certain groups whose participation in the city's workforce remains low. Part of the aim of intro 755A and intro 756A is to help shade some light on how the city can ensure that its workforce is representative of the workforce as a whole. The current way of reporting diversity data makes it difficult to track the progress of a different group, intro 755A, would therefore require the Equal Employment Practices Commission, EEPC, when, which is an independent non-mayoral city entity, to report annually on whether agencies are meeting the Equal Employment Opportunities Goal, and when they are not, the EEPC would be required to specially identify and provide corrective recommendation to address underutilization. And Rule 756A would therefore require DCAS to review its racial classification categories and make the recommendation for how to improve the use of categories. This uh, bill would also require DCAS to annually report on the city's effort to collect diversity data and the response rate from employees. I want to thank all the wonderful people from the committee who work hard to make this possible. Those two bills are very important bills since we know that uh, New York City is home to so many people, you know, coming from everywhere. I think we got to capitalize on that. This is a big asset for all of us to have so many people from diverse, from different ethnic backgrounds. And I think this is something that, that will empower the city and make the city great. Thank you very much for, to all of you who have worked on this bill. And uh, Speaker, thank you very much for thank your you, leadership. Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is today's agenda. So if anyone has any on topic questions, happy to. Seth? I'm sorry, on topic. On topic. Okay. On topic. Anything on any of these? Off topic. Seth? Oh, wow. <laughs> you want to talk about my bill? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I think the MTA, <clears throat> and I think Andy Byford said that the number of folks who are uh, walking through the doors when they are opened at the subway stations or boarding buses without paying, it's clearly having a very significant impact on the MTA's revenue, which is a problem. Um, I do not support uh, arresting people. I think that the Manhattan DA and the Brooklyn DA moving towards a summons-based system is uh, a deterrent. I think one of the things that we're seeing here, at least uh, preliminarily from what I read, I don't have all the data, is that not all of the folks, a, a significant number of folks who are um, engaging in fare evasion, um, a number of them are people who are living in poverty. That's clear. But there's also a significant number of people who aren't living in poverty who are just walking through the doors when they're opened without an adequate level of enforcement um, to deter that. So I think you can balance the needs of ensuring that people need to pay the fare, uh, while at the exact same time ensuring that people are not ending up on Rikers Island uh, for not paying the fare. I think there's a balance that needs to be struck. I supported the Manhattan DA and the Brooklyn DA when they made this move, but the MTA is in such a dire financial situation, we can't have a huge amount of fare evasion. The other thing that I'm not sure about is that uh, when they placed people in certain subway stations to gather this level of data, I, I haven't seen a breakdown of um, s 
how they chose those subway stations, the formula that they found on understanding were these the right subway stations to pick. I think there are some other questions that we have to ask. And I, and I also think that um, Cy Vance put out um, a, a brief uh, last week when Andy Byford made those comments, pushing back on some of the uh, assumptions that were in Andy Byford's comments. <clears throat> I think Andy Byford's doing a good job. Uh, I really respect the work that he's done. I support the fast forward plan, uh, but I also think that there are many factors at play here and it's not easy to talk about it with a broad brush. Rosa? I don't think I'm in the position to, to uh, every time something happens, I'm not sure I'm the best person to comment on how the mayor should have commented. Uh, but I, but my, my reaction is it was um, appalling, heartbreaking, disturbing. Um, I saw the video because you tweeted it on uh, Sunday morning. That's how I first saw the video. And I immediately said, what do we have to do here to sort of shine some light on this and figure out how to ensure this doesn't happen? I think that, that three minute video encapsulates and shows you in a very short period of time many things that are wrong in our criminal justice system right now that a parent could be separated from her child um, so quickly, mm -hmm. the violence involved, the fact that she was waiting for four hours at a HRA center for childcare vouchers. I mean, it's sort of a confluence of the systemic issues mm -hmm. that um, really plague our city, and I think a pretty unfair, uneven, and disturbing way, and so, um, Anyone who watches that video, anyone, I think should be disturbed by it, and I think everyone should speak up about it. I think that everyone should speak up about this, and I was happy to see that the Brooklyn DA uh, dropped charges and the order of protection was lifted because there were not charges. She should be off Rikers Island. She should not be on Rikers Island. She should be reunited with her son, and um, I look forward to a full investigation to understand what happened. I requested a meeting with the police commissioner and with the social service commissioner, Banks, um, to understand how this happened and to try to ensure this never happens again. There's a CCRB complaint. I think it's strange that yesterday there was a ceremony in the Blue Room related to the anniversary of the CCRB being created with former Mayor Dinkins um, there and advocates on police reform and transparency um, on the day that the entire city was wanting to hear something vocally about what happened to Jasmine Headley and her son. I think it's strange to have that event and not have a full conversation and have a full comment um, on this. Mm -hmm. I think a moment when the city, when the entire city is focused on such an appalling and inhumane incident, I think it's important for all leaders to step up and speak about it in a full manner with the hopefully moral force of their office behind them. I just wanted to say because my son is 16 months old so I can thoroughly relate to this particular situation in so many ways. Um, we were out front today at 8 a.m. with my son and many others um, demanding justice because this situation is so horrific and traumatizing and angering and racist um, that it puts a permanent stain um, on our police department if these officers are not brought to justice. If we see someone waving around a taser, we see someone violently 
tearing apart a mother and a child. Uh, to me, for Mayor Bill de Blasio, he should be at the forefront of this situation, and he should act as swiftly um, as if that was Charlene McRae on the ground and having Dante at that stage grabbed from Charlene's arms. He should come with the same passion um, that he would feel if that had been his own wife. The commissioner should follow suit. Anyone that sees that video should look at it and think about if that were me, if that were my wife, if that were my sister, how would I respond? And we can't look at it and say, that's this economically challenged black woman, and so therefore it doesn't matter. The other issue is also we're seeing a criminalization of the victim, this woman. She goes in for services, she's on Rikers Island, now her whole life story is being pulled apart and she's being further traumatized by this whole situation. This is the issue that we are speaking about that as black women, and, and I said it before, you know, Malcolm X said that there's no woman that's more vulnerable in the world than the black woman. And so we have to rise up, we have to bring justice to these officers, and those officers being fired from my seat is the least of what should happen here. We need that and we need a total revamping of all of the agencies involved in this. I feel that they have not been at the forefront of the issue, and I feel that that's disappointing. Um, it's, it's upsetting that they are not at the forefront given how they come to their seats of power and understanding the dynamics of... What do you mean by that? Well, I, I look at this because I'm a black woman, and I'm a black woman with a black child who's 17 months old. So for me, looking at that video, I, re I recognize that black women across the city are gonna look at me and say, you know in the pit of your stomach what this feels like and how you would feel if this happened to you. So when you elect leaders, you're, you're sort of looking at them to represent your issues, and in this case, your pain. So we're looking at a first lady and we're looking at it, you have two children, you could be in that same position 20 years ago, the, you, you have some of the, 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 the same uh, circumstances in terms of your racial identity here, so we're looking at you to be that face. Come forward, you're not locked up in Rikers Island. So I stood out there at eight o'clock, we'll stand out there at one o'clock because I am in a position of power. My son is in daycare, thank God, that I didn't have to wait there, but because I didn't have to wait there and because I'm a black woman and because I, I have this position, I have to be out front. I have to speak out on the issue because Jasmine and her son are depending on us as well as black women throughout the city who feel that much more vulnerable right now. I think that when you look at an agency, it's not all about um, color in that sense. It's about practice, it's about training, it's about orders, it's about leadership, it's about all of these different things. Um, but at the same time, when you see a black mother with a child coming for services, there's a number of calculations that are made. Whether you're a person of color or not coming into the situation, you make a calculation in terms of determining what are gonna be the repercussions for me doing what I'm doing. And they made a calculated decision that attacking this woman with her child was going to yield no repercussions. And so that's why it's important for us to stand up, to be vocal about it, and to send a message that black women count. And when you attack black women, particularly with their children, there will be repercussions so that you will think the next time you walk into a situation like that, that you can absolutely not attack a woman in need because of her color, because of her vulnerability. That's why it's important to stand up and speak out about issues such as this. I, I just want to let Peter Koo uh, speak about his bills oh. on machine readable formats. <clears throat> Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. Yeah. Today I'm introducing uh, 986A, which will help streamline government data so that reports graphs, charts, 
and other critical files submitted to the city council would be required to be machine readable so that they could be automatically processed. This will help cut down on paperwork and improve the efficiency of all reporting done by city agencies while simultaneously moving the city council further online and creating a more user-friendly and transparent government. I want to thank the speaker and all the co-sponsors for this bill, along with the committee staff who work on the bill, including my committee counsel, Ivy uh, Bajowski, Brad Reed, Patrick Reedy, and Sebastian Bacci. Thank you, uh, Megan Chen, Tisa Lassan, Thank you for all the data operation team, especially James and Rose, and my own staff. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Katie. I just wanted to flip to Amazon this morning. Steve released the city's schedule proposal for bids last week. Um, So when this deal was announced, I was um, very uh, vocal about my concerns related to the subsidies involved, the subverting of the city's land use process, uh, the displacement concerns, gentrification concerns, local hiring concerns, I mean, many, many unanswered questions. And that's really the point of this hearing, is for us to ask all sorts of questions which haven't been asked in a public manner uh, with a transparent process. Uh, there has not really been, I think, the difficult questions that have needed to be asked about the financials of this deal and about the land use aspects, the neighborhood concerns, the list goes on. So we are going to um, approach tomorrow's hearing through the lens of trying to get as much information uh, as possible available to the public, uh, and that's really how we're going at this. I didn't see the announcement on the community advisory uh, panel, but if they wanted real uh, community input, they would go through ULERP, which has worked time and time again. Mm -hmm. What do you, you know, say to, in this proposal that was spent a year ago, I mean, this seems to almost have the fact that they would uh, take over our local land use issue and zoning as a benefit, you know, and it seemed like that was kind of from the beginning of the plan to... Wait, say that again, Katie, I'm not sure I understand. No, No, and again, the process was cloaked in secrecy and in darkness with non-disclosure agreements being signed between city and state officials and a multi-billion dollar, almost trillion dollar company uh, to try to entice them to come here. We have uh, 4.2 million private sector jobs in New York City. We've seen 700,000 jobs created over the last 10 years, one of the largest economic expansions in the history of the city uh, in decades and decades. So 25,000 jobs is a good thing. I'm, I, we want 25,000 jobs, but 25,000 jobs in New York City is not the same thing as 25,000 jobs in Pittsburgh or Seattle or uh, Crystal City, Virginia. It's not the same thing. And so I am not sure that it is uh, worth it to go through the concessions that were given, the subverting of the land use process, and I have questions why were two sites that are really unrelated to Amazon folded into this, a city-owned site that was RFP'd out and TF Cornerstone won that proposal on the north and a private site, a Plaxel site on the south. We reduced the amount of affordable housing in there. All sorts of questions. I don't, I'm not sure that Amazon would have said we're not coming to New York City if we made them go through the land use process. We're gonna ask that question tomorrow, but they came here because of the human capital that we have here. Uh, the number of people who work in New York City who are qualified for tech-related jobs that, and, uh, that Amazon needs, we're number one in the entire country with the number of people here who can do those jobs. So I think they got more than they needed, and we're gonna ask all sorts of questions tomorrow about this. Rich? coming for witnesses and how would you describe 
the intensity of the questions that they would take? Well, I'm going to ask intense questions, but I don't know about my colleagues. Um, I'm sure that Councilmember Van Bramer uh, is going to be pretty vigorous in his questioning. Uh, we have senior level people from Amazon. I believe the gentleman who signed the MOU is going to be there tomorrow. And we have uh, their senior person involved in uh, global economic development. development. Uh, so he's going to be there. She's going to be there. Uh, and we have the president of the Economic Development Corporation, James Patchett, who's coming. We invited and asked uh, many times for the economic, for the Empire State Development Corporation, Howard Zemsky to come, and they're not coming, which I'm very disappointed about. Summer? This is the first time I'm hearing that. I, I don't. I, I, this is news well, to me. That same as Virginia, they're going to give Amazon a heads up anytime there's a public reference request, specifically stating that it would give them time to go to court to block that request. Totally inappropriate. Again, goes to the secrecy of the process. Uh, if they were proud of this deal, they should be as transparent as possible about the deal. And uh, if Amazon was proud of how they got here, they should be as open as well. Amazon's doing quite well. They, sh they would be fine with being transparent. I guess this is an image issue, uh, but they're probably going to make their image worse by wanting to do things like that. Uh, the bigger question there is that there's some vendors involved here, and I'm sure Julie would and Pat cares about freedom of information law. And <coughs> is there anything the city council can do to improve that? Uh, on the first, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I don't know how their FOIL process works. Uh, you know, we do things a certain way here at the council, which predate my time as speaker, uh, but I can't really, I, I'm not educated enough to know how they handle it. I'm sure, of course, certain reporters have had a very bad experience in wanting to get things uh, from the administration, but you know, it's all sort of individualized. It depends on the request. It depends on what's being asked. So I can't speak about it in a, in a general way. Rich? Um, would you please just throw it down to the EU about fucking Jenny's advocate and try to make Embarrassing. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> I want that job. <laughs> Don't find me. No, Where, where's Waldo? <laughs> Where was your press conference on this? I didn't know he existed. <laughs> It's, it's embarrassing, it is uh, a disgrace. Uh, if someone is given a job, it doesn't matter if their job is a job that uh, pays at the lower end or a job that this gentleman's making, which I think he's making $120,000 a year. Uh, you need to go to work, you need to set up the hotline, you need to have a computer that's working, you need to be there available to the public if that's what your job is, to be, I think, the parking advocate, which reminds me that Helen Rosenthal passed a bill on creating a tenant advocate for the Department of Buildings, which could be a big story because uh, the administration hasn't actually created the position in the meaningful way that the council passed and we keep asking them to do this. Uh, but, you know, if your job is to be an advocate for the public and to help them navigate city government if you're having an issue you need to be available mm -hmm. and clearly this man is not doing the job and if he doesn't want to do the job they should find someone else who wants to do the job who will do the job this ultimately is uh, the person who needs to be accountable for this is the finance commissioner it falls under him he's in charge of the agency Jillian? Uh, I wanted to ask you about the Oath Commissioner who uh, came to City Hall uh, last month for a city council event, uh, for the Libertarian event, and uh, apparently uh, the city council didn't recognize him. He was simply standing there. It seems like police officer yelled in his name, kept his gaze at one point. Uh, it's something that's caught on video. The police commissioner says he's seen this video, and that the commissioner's conduct was uh, egregious, as opposed to a violation of the Fourth. I'm just curious, I mean, have you looked into this at all? 
concerns about we just had a couple follow-up stories about him yelling at other people including lawmakers. Just concerns about his temperament and you want to hear more from Mr. Paul. It's never appropriate to be disrespectful to anyone, especially a member of the NYPD, a woman who was just doing her job. My understanding from your reporting and from other things that I've heard is that he flashed a badge and she didn't know what he was flashing and she very respectfully asked who he was and he went on a tirade and started to use misogynistic language and started swearing at her and calling her babe. It is totally, wholly inappropriate, unacceptable. He was coming, I guess, to the Puerto Rican Heritage event here at the council. I was at that event. I, 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 uh, I don't remember him being there. Uh, I may have acknowledged him in my remarks, but I don't have any memory of it. Um, I've never met him before. I don't know him. Uh, but clearly, if you are the chief judge, you should have better temperament on how to treat people than the way he behaved himself. It's my understanding that there is uh, body-worn camera footage, not from the officer that he was uh, being verbally abusive to, but from another officer who walked over and flipped on the body-worn camera. And I'm told that it's even more disturbing than the reports suggest. Rosa? James Patchett's testifying. Yeah, so he was invited by the officer at the time. Why did he decide? That's a good question. And do you think she should? She yes. Should the face of this she should. She, she should show up. She gave a very long interview uh, right when the deal was announced with New York Magazine, where she talked about the deal in depth and the genesis of the deal. She should do that in front of the uh, municipal legislature in the city of New York to answer our questions. We've said that. We've said that about Howard Zemsky and the Empire State Development Corporation. We are glad that Amazon is coming. It was not easy to get Amazon here. Uh, they did not want to come, but I'm grateful that they're coming um, so that we can have a conversation with them. Uh, and uh, James Patchett will be there to answer our questions from the administration. But I think both Howard Zemsky and Alicia Glenn should be at the hearing. Have you personally talked to her about it at all? No. Definitely. Multiple times. And when you were speaking at the time, you were ignored? We were told that the person they were going to send is James Patchett. Well, Bobby? In terms of um, any disciplinary action against the NYPD officers, uh, in any case, do you have any opinion on the Councilwoman Summers said she thinks she should be fired at a minimum? Do you have any opinion on, on how they should be disciplined if at all? I don't know what justification can be given for that video where you see the officer, at least in the initial video that was posted, multiple tryings trying to rip the baby away from Jasmine Headley, a one-year-old child, a taser that is close to her head. I don't know what level of justification there can be. If there are other facts that are gonna come out, I would like to know what they are. There's a CCRB complaint. The Brooklyn DA dropped charges. Um, it is completely and totally unacceptable. I do think that there's a bigger issue here of how things got escalated from the HRA peace officers before the NYPD even arrived at the scene. Uh, things were escalated in a significant way uh, with those HRA officers that were put on modified duty uh, during this time as the investigation starts to move ahead. So there needs to be disciplinary action here. It is totally unacceptable. It doesn't make me feel safe to have officers treating a young mother and a child that way. This happened in uh, Council Member Levin's district, so I want to let him speak on this, and also the chair of our Women's Committee, Helen Rosenthal, if she had anything she wanted to say on this as well. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank you for your leadership on this. I want to thank the Majority Leader for her leadership on this as well. Um, this is uh, uh, an appalling incident. It's a tragedy. Um, I saw the video, and, and uh, my heart broke as well for this young mother who was just there taking a day off of work um, to uh, secure her childcare benefits at an HRA center. And um, uh, according to an eyewitness that I spoke to uh, personally, uh, had did nothing other than sit on the floor as an offense. And um, nobody uh, should be treated like that uh, in a New York City facility whatsoever. And so there's no excuse for 
um, what transpired on the part of the city, but I think it's important to examine each step of the way because I think that there were bad decisions made um, all along this process um, that led to uh, that led to to Ms. Headley, um, uh, frankly, being attacked uh, 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 by by multiple mm -hmm. um, uh, officers and security personnel. Um, one thing that we want to look at is uh, what's going on in our HRA centers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a nearby SNAP center that, due to leasing issues, was recently closed on DeKalb Avenue, um, and uh, we had heard from. Uh, organizations that work with uh, with low-income clients in, in North Brooklyn, that they were uh, seeing an impact in terms of wait times and where they had to go um, uh, in terms of being diverted. And so we had already been hearing about this, uh, and we had a meeting with HRA about this uh, just two weeks ago, about the impact of, of that closure on DeKalb and what, what, what's, what's happened to the nearby center. So, um, we're looking at legislation right now um, to, to get clear information about uh, HRA centers and wait times um, and, and what's really happening there and I think that we need to do a deeper dive there um, uh, because this should have never happened just because there was no seats available for this young mother and her child. Uh, and to, you know, so beyond the, 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 the issues that, that the speakers, uh, uh, you know, so effectively addressed, I think that we also need to be looking systemically at what's going on with our public benefits. Helen? Yeah, um, thank you, Speaker, course, and course. thank you for your immediate uh, tweet of outrage, rightly so. Um, I really just want to focus on two things. Number one, uh, no one disagrees with the research that the most important thing you could do for a mother with her child is keep them together. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Mm -hmm. You know, media has done great research and reports on what's happening with foster care. All arrows point to keeping the child and the mother together. So the first failure is really with the HRA workers not allowing this situation to happen. The minute someone saw her on the floor, they should have sat down next to her and said, wow, this must be a really rotten situation for you. Mm -hmm. This is awful. How are you? And how that could not be the first response of an employee is beyond me. And all I can think to what my colleague alluded to is the lack of resources. When the workers themselves are overstressed and overworked, it's not uncommon for someone to react badly to a situation. The second issue has to do with the legislation that Speaker Johnson uh, passed a couple of months ago with the NYPD and the FETI training. And this is the training that all officers in the PD would get that's survivor-centric, that would allow them, enable them to recognize and behave from a survivor-centric perspective. Trauma-based. Tra survivor and trauma-based, thank you, trauma-based perspective. So the fact that the PD, let alone the HRA uh, peace officer, could not understand that this was a traumatic event and not respond appropriately with such a traumatic event, again, is beyond me. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful that all, all agencies involved will come in and explain what happened to the city council sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Because we're going out to a 1 p.m. Uh, rally on the steps. Anyone? Great. Thank you all.